culture. So I think going down to Peru, to, to ayahuasca in another cultural context, the key part, as other people have said before, is feeling safe. Is feeling that, and it's sometimes difficult to feel safe when you don't really know all the symbolism, the cultural meanings. So I think that I, I personally have found that the best ayahuasca experiences I've had have been in a therapeutic context, not in a religious context, but more in a kind of a Western context, but still imbued with a certain spirituality. So I, I think I would just encourage you to also explore opportunities in the United States for ayahuasca. Not to say you shouldn't go, but I think the key part is you know, making sure that you can feel safe in this other context, and then you can explore and heal and do a variety of things. <laughs> I don't know, I mean, uh, are we ever really safe? <laughs> yes. <laughs> did, did somebody else have a, I mean, I don't know whether when my 20 minutes is up and other people starts, but, um, uh, yeah. During the 60s. Or just stand up and speak really loud. Uh, during the 60s when there was this perception that a quarter in age transformation was imminent, was there a consensus as to when it would come? Did people say like 1970? Would, like, would, would it fixate on, on some particular time, or would it just always seem to be coming? Oh, uh, no, I think I think that the general take it certainly as as late as late 19 the summer of 1967 was that it was going to be real soon. <laughs> that, I mean, like and. We were members of what Time Magazine called the Now Generation, so real soon with us was you know, like a, a New York nanosecond away. Uh, Sorry, but that seems like a real simplification. Well, I'm not. I mean, you had a lot of people who were actually like activists working for some systemic social change. Oh, no, no, but I mean, there was... A, a lot of those efforts were actually stymied by the system. No, but the, but the, but the activists and the acid heads didn't get along well at all. I mean, that was actually a very bitter, angry schism. Uh, I mean, I remember that one time Larry, I mean, Kesey and the, and the pranksters went to a, a peace march in Berkeley and, and they'd asked Keith Ken to speak and he, he got up there with this uniform that he'd made with, you know, uh, model plane epaulets. <laughs> it's really pretty showy, but it was funny and they didn't think any of this stuff was funny. It was not funny, you know. Uh, you couldn't joke about it and... and uh, and we felt like everything was a joke because, you know, all of the things that, that society was taking deadly seriously were going to be over in a very short time. I mean, that was certainly the, the, the dominant view around where I was. And I mean, I grant you, I was, you know, I was, I was at Millbrook a lot of the time and I was with the Grateful Dead a lot of the time. And those were two intense reality distortion fields, but I... <laughs> I, I felt like even in Wyoming, I was running across people that thought that everything was about to happen immediately. And well, I mean, it depends on you know. I think one of, one of the great things about having been around for a long time <laughs> is you develop a sense of patience. Um, just as speaking for someone that's not been allowed around for a long time. Um, I think one of the things that's different with the kind of new wave of individuals that are using psychedelics is, unlike previously, there isn't this kind of large standard, say for example, the Grateful Dead and you know Woodstock and just the idea that you're part of something much bigger. And one of the things that I think we've seen in rave culture is that, you know, MDMA is this very kind of binding thing where you're going to work with your cohort and feel good about, you know, your family and the family or the people that you hang out and go to parties with and all that. But psychedelics are a much deeper you know, it's like going to the other end of the pool. You know, there are lots of people playing in the shallow end and then occasionally people swim out and they come back. And one of my, I guess my question is, how at this point do we generate that unified field when there are people that are coming with that type of influence from all over the world? People are listening to psychedelic music from Israel and, you know, China and Africa and all that kind of stuff. And it's not, there's no real modern American psychedelic, as it were. I, I think, you know, I actually think we're getting there on a global basis. I mean, I, I've been very 
very much uh, switched in. I've been trying to help internet communications in Egypt over the last few days. At, uh, you know, and I've been in a sort of continuous dialogue with a lot of people who are there. And, and one of the things that seems obvious is that there is something really new happening there. Uh, and, and other places that I look where you have people that are just basically sick of dualism. Uh, and, and sick of there being this clear us versus them mentality. And, you know, of course, in, here in America, we're trying to turn all these sort of uh, heterogeneous uh, Christian, Coptic, atheist, you know, young, old, familial, conservative, liberal people that are gathered in Tahrir Square into the, into the Muslim Brotherhood so they can all be other. But I think that that kind of worship is almost, you know, in its final ages uh, here in this society and in those societies. I mean, one of the great things about, about psychedelics is I think they, they tear the crap out of monotheism. And, I, you know, I think much of what is, what is going on in the world at the moment is, is the result of the fact that monotheism is dying and, and being unpleasant about it. <laughs> I, I, that's a really good question. I mean, that's part of what we're trying to do with Evolver and Reality Sandwich is create some kind of, you know, intellectual and conceptual foundation so that as people go back into these experiences, you know, they can understand what the heritage of the past was and then make their own determination, you know. And um, it is very exciting and you're really maybe lucky to, to be at this moment. I mean, it also is interesting how there's a psychedelic resurgence at, at a time of global crisis, you know, which we saw also in the 60s, like one of the big, you know, one analysis of the 60s is that it was a huge response to the Cuban Missile Crisis and that sense that the whole situation could be wiped out, you know, at any moment. You know, we're now facing a uh, climate change crisis that is extremely uh, threatening and, and we don't yet know how to make a collective or coherent uh, response to it. The attempts we've made so far have been uh, pretty lame, you know. So, 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 you know, and, and somehow, you know, as Terence McKenna writes about it really well, like psychedelics are one of the only things that are powerful enough to get people to really turn on a dime and recognize how, you know, their, their social, you know, conditioning has created a form of consciousness that is part of an entirely destructive system that, that's, you know, laying waste to the planet's resources and allowing for the, 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 this, you know, species extinction, climate change, resource depletion, and so on. So that hopefully is where psychedelics come in handy is they can pull people up sharp, make them see that there's a lot more going on, that their consciousness is a lot more bigger, and that what they've inherited as, as, a lot, as their subjectivity is, is often a lot of programming. You know, and in which case they can begin again to, to, to move in a different direction. Thank you. Yeah, I got a, I got a question. Uh, wait, 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 we don't have time to do this. No, 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 wait. Can you say